We're in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula. It was through this desert that the Hebrews traveled after leaving Egypt. If it wasn't for the cloud giving them shade during the day, their trek through this desert would have been very arduous indeed. Indeed, how many days does the Bible give for their journey through this wilderness? The answer is found right here in the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus tells us how Moses encountered God in the burning bush. God instructed Moses to return to Egypt, go to Pharaoh and request that the Hebrews be allowed to make a three-day journey into the wilderness. Thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. And now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Moses obeyed. He returned to Egypt and made the request to Pharaoh. Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God. We're on the highway from the Suez Canal to Nueva. You can see the sign here says Nueva 330 kilometers. That's the distance the Hebrews would have walked from Sukkoth to Nueva in the three days. This is the Sinai Desert. As you can see, it's just a vast, broad, flat plain. It goes on for miles. It's very hot here in the Sinai Desert. But when the Hebrews went through here, they had the cloud overshadowing them, which kept them nice and cool. I'm going to use a GPS and illustrate the average speed they would have had to keep up to cross the wilderness from Sukkoth to Nueva in the time allocated. That speed is three and a half miles an hour. And I'm now walking at three and a half miles an hour through the wilderness of the Red Sea. This is the pace they would have kept up. After crossing the Sinai Desert, they finally came into this area here. You can see this is the beginning of the wadi, very rugged mountains. And this is the start of the canyon that leads down to the Red Sea. Occasionally you'll get flash floods coming down this wadi. Huge amounts of water just rush down. And what that does is it leaves dirty water marks on the rocks up here. And in fact, on here you can see river sediment left behind. I'll show you some of this. Like here, this is all sediment from the water. And here, this has been deposited by flash flooding coming down the wadi. That shows how much water has come down here at some times. We're now in the Wadi Watiya. This is the canyon that leads from the Sinai Desert down to the Red Sea. And this brings us to another very interesting Bible verse. In Exodus chapter 14, God tells Moses to turn and come down this way. Pharaoh was going to get news that the Hebrews were here. And this is what God tells Moses in Exodus 14 verse 3. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, the wilderness hath shut them in. As they came down this canyon, they were effectively shut in, and to the Pharaoh they looked entangled in the land. This canyon is called Wadi Watir, and it leads right down to the Red Sea. And we're following this now down to where the Hebrews went.
Weary and hungry after their long trek, many of them must have been wondering how long until we reach our destination. Then suddenly they round this bend and before them is the Red Sea. Behind us we can see the hills of Arabia and in front of that the Gulf of Aqaba. This is Nueba, large enough for two million people to camp the time the Egyptian army was chasing them. This is where the two million Hebrews camped and it was down through the same canyon the Egyptian army was chasing them. And it was here that God was going to do something wonderful. From here, according to the scriptures, Moses and his people could travel no farther. Then the Egyptians chased after them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army. And they overtook them camping by the sea, beside Pi Hahiroth. The historian Josephus provides another clue about the location of Pihahiroth, for his description of the Israelites' crisis matches the terrain surrounding Nueva Beach. Now, when the Egyptians had overtaken the Hebrews, they also seized on the passages by which they imagined the Hebrews might fly, shutting them up between inaccessible precipices and the sea. For there was on each side a ridge of mountains that terminated at the sea, which were impassable by reason of their roughness and obstructed their flight. That description perfectly fits the geography of this region. The Hebrews could no longer go any further. They were trapped between the sea and the mountains. This is where God was going to open the water and save his people. Well, we've seen that the biblical evidence brings us to this location here in the Gulf of Aqaba. Therefore, we should find on the seabed behind us the remains of Pharaoh's army. So we're going to go diving now and look for the evidence of the 250,000 Egyptians and all the chariots of Egypt that were lost in the water behind us. So let's go and have a look. If we assume that a number of artifacts were spread out on the seabed, sooner or later corals would start to grow on them. And of course if you have a number of layers or coral growing on something, it's very hard to distinguish the structure that was there from the very beginning. Though the coral complicates any search here, it may have been instrumental in preserving the shapes of ancient artifacts. For coral is a living organism that will not begin to grow on a foundation of sand or silt. Instead, it must first attach itself to a solid object, where it will sometimes conform to the shape of its host. So for instance, if it would grow on a wooden artifact, the wood would normally disappear in the seawaters after a time. But if you have corals growing on the wooden artifact, uh, the coral could have the shape of the wooden artifact. And then the corals would consume the wooden material over periods of time but still keep the shape of the wooden artifacts. During the course of his explorations, Moller observed that the pattern of coral growth at Nueva differed from other parts of the Gulf. Unlike the coral at the northern and southern ends of Aqaba, which often forms large, dense reefs, some covering many acres, the formations at Nueva Beach are generally smaller and scattered randomly across the sea floor. Divers familiar with the area have compared the distribution of coral here to a junkyard and the aftermath of a disaster. This description is fitting, and among the strange formations in these waters, many display features indicative of human engineering.
When we dive and when we film at the Noveba location, we look for certain structures and you try to look for 90 degree angles or circular objects. We like structures, so that is what you scan for, so to speak, when you dive. There are situations where you see something that looks like an axle, a hub, something that looks like a wheel, and you say to yourself, this is not a coral reef, this is a coral growth on an artifact. And that is what's different to me when I compare corals at other locations around the world. Since the earliest explorations at Nueva, one distinctive type of formation has often been identified on the sea floor. A slender, table-like structure, sometimes standing on end, with a coral-encrusted base, a straight shaft, and a circular top. It's a 90-degree angle, a right angle, between something that looks like an axle and the wheel. And you can see this in different varieties, and it looks very different from normal coral growth. And uh, it is like a man-made structure with a coral growth on it. A common question is, why didn't you bring up artifacts? And there are several answers to that. The best thing to do when you find something is just to keep it in position. Document it, but keep it in position. It's very easy to destroy anything. And the other thing, it's illegal to remove artifacts, but also you're not allowed to bring up any corals from the Red Sea. Despite the passage of time since the Exodus, 3,500 years ago, evidence remains today of metal chariot parts encrusted in the coral. The use of an underwater metal detector can easily locate metallic remains within the coral. Although it is not always possible to identify specific chariot parts embedded in the coral, a metal detector reveals that many of the formations off Nueva contain metal artifacts. I would estimate about 25% of the formations down there still retains enough metal to give positive readings on the metal detector. The echo sounder uses hydroacoustic technology by bouncing an echo down to the seabed and back, then measuring the elapsed time. Uh, from this information, the instrument can accurately determine the depth of water at a given position. The equipment is manufactured by Simrad in Scandinavia, one of the world leaders in modern marine electronics. Part of the system includes a transmitting and receiving unit, which we mounted to a length of steel pipe. This was then suspended just below the water surface from the side of the dive boat. We set up the equipment so that we could record on our laptop computer the position and depth every one to two seconds as the boat travelled through the water. Vivica worked in Saudi Arabia over a two year period and made five visits to Jebel El Laws. The arrow is pointing this way to Mount Sinai. Vivica also uh, completed many dives on the Saudi coastline directly opposite Nueva, locating and photographing coral-encrusted chariot parts near the shoreline. And the Bible tells that Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore after they came across. So I figured there must be some stuff on the Saudi side. At one spot there is like a very shallow sort of land tongue going out in a straight angle towards Nueva. You could tell it by the shift of the color of the water. It's, it, you could see how it was turquoise, far out, you know. So I thought this would be interesting for exploration. So we did some dives near to that. The scattered, irregular coral formations on the Saudi side of Aqaba resemble those previously found off the Nueva Peninsula.
In the midst of them, Pan Qian photographed this circular object attached to what appears to have been a broken axle or hub. This discovery was significant for two reasons. Pan Tien had documented the coral encrusted form of a wheel with dimensions similar to ancient Egyptian artifacts directly across from the proposed Nueva crossing site. Her find also provided independent confirmation of earlier evidence establishing wheel-like formations on both coasts of the Red Sea in accordance with descriptions in the biblical record. And the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army, and he made the wheels of their chariots come off. Viveka recorded on a handheld global positioning system the exact location where she found the chariot parts on the Saudi coastline. And we were able to use her coordinates to set a direct course from the crossing entry point at Nuweiba to the opposite coastline where the Israelites would have exited to the shore. It is interesting to note that the course was exactly due east from the Nuweiba entry point. This corresponds to the biblical account of the strong east wind blowing all night and making the sea into dry land. We were given the exact position where remains of chariot parts have been located on the Saudi coastline. So uh, when we left the Nuweiba point where similar chariot parts have been found, we made a direct course to the position identified on the Saudi side. And as we moved along this course, we could see a gradual increase in seabed depth on the monitor. But what was very exciting was that there was no sudden drop-off. It was just a gentle slope all the way as we went towards the Saudi coastline. Our recordings indicate that the maximum depth along the ledge is very deep, is in excess of 500 metres. Biblical account makes reference to this. The great deep, the mighty waters and the depths in the heart of the sea. Jerry Harnett has been in the film and video industry for four decades and is the post-production supervisor for Discovering Media. He was the leader of the film crew on this uh, Exodus assignment in Egypt. Joseph Condelis is a professional diver from the United States and he was able to join us for the next three days diving with our group. Jerry also came out with us on one trip to do some filming. 